say welcome everyone. And we're still getting people put in um, their little intros in the chat. I do want to start just by maybe saying who I am. If you don't know me, I'm sure many of us know each other, but my name is Joy Brown. I work at North York Community House and I'm a youth worker with North York Community House. I'm super happy to have you here. I'm so happy we're able to do this virtually uh, and meet. Um, and yes, um, we're just going to get started very soon. Um, I know we're still typing in the chat, um, but we want to actually adhere to our agenda. So I think we're good to go. It's just a thumbs up, Milena, if we're good to go. You can just do actual real thumbs up or <laughs> emoji thumbs up. So if we know we're good to go. Okay, awesome. Awesome. So lots of people are still introducing themselves on the chat. That's really great. But we're actually going to get right into our first opening remarks from Mohammed, who is a student of our program. So go ahead, Mohammed. Yeah, hello and good afternoon. And welcome to our first Youth Architects Conference. My name is Mohammed, and I'm a student of the 2020 Youth Architects Program and a resident of the Lawrence Heights community. As for our agenda today, first we will be having an introduction to the Youth Architects Program, just a brief introduction. Secondly, our design teams will be pre presenting their designs for the pavilion. Next, UFT and Ryan Sin will be um, conducting a presentation. And then we will be ending off the conference for the day honoring the 2020 Youth Architects. And that's basically it. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, before we begin, begin, we want to do a quick thank you to all of our resident co-facilitators, our partners in the program and also the conference, Ryerson, University of Toronto, Jane Finch Community and Family Center Sustainable, which has been a long-standing partner in our programs. Thank you so much, Joel, for being here. We want to thank our speakers and mentors, Reza, Rick, Derek Brunel, uh, our funders, City of Toronto, Cultural Hotspots, and United Way. Um, and also a big shout out to our designer for our conference. She designed all of our like little cool slides. Her name is Rosie. Follow her on Instagram. She's very talented and we're very thankful for her talents for uh, this conference. We're going to start with a land acknowledgement. I also want to acknowledge that we're also we're we're all kind of meeting from different places, maybe even outside of Toronto. Uh, this is North York Community House's land acknowledgement, but we want to acknowledge all Indigenous folks from Turtle Island. Uh, we want to acknowledge that we're on sacred land, and we want to acknowledge that those peoples uh, because we understand that the past and the present all matter in the work that we do. We acknowledge the land in which we gather is a traditional territory of many First Nations, including Wendat, Ojibwe, Huron, Haudenosaunee, Chippewa, and the Mississaugas of the New Credit. We at North York Community House honor the territory's indigenous history and move forward in the spirit of reconciliation and to the enduring presence of First Nation, the Métis Nation, and the Inuit peoples. So we're gonna go right into our recap of our program. At any point, if you have a question, a concern, uh, please put it in the chat or unmute yourself. It's totally fine if we have a conversation. We're all friends here, right? So uh, <laughs> I don't have to be the only one that's talking. Um, and if it doesn't make sense, let me know. Uh, just put it in the chat or unmute yourself. Um, our Youth Architects program for this year, we were able to engage 15 youth and residents from Lawrence Heights and also surrounding communities in a co-design process over the period of six weeks online, y'all, online. <laughs> and we were to build understanding and empathy around the impacts of the Lawrence Heights community revitalization, uh, recognize res residents as experts of their own experience and their, their value in the design process. We got a chance to reimagine the community through a strengths-based approach, allowing imagination to be fueled by the hopes and dreams of residents. And now they get a chance to present their ideas right now at the conference uh, to all of you uh, in, a, in an effort to advocate for their desires and needs to be incorporated, incorporated into the Lawrence Heights Revitalization Plan. So we came up with the uh, ideas of the parameters, building parameters and program requirements that we set up for the students as a main uh, uh, design challenge. And so the parameters are 300 square meters enclosed space uh, uh, in the footprint, and then 100 square meters outdoor space allowed as well. And the overall heights should be around 15 meters. So we uh, assumed that we can uh, locate uh, these programs that we would like to incorporate in the building 
between uh, three floors, could be uh, one floor, two floor, or three floors uh, building, and then uh, three programs will represent three councils, residence councils, uh, which are youth council, uh, senior council, and parent council. And uh, one important requirement that we put in our program is that the spaces that we will create and design should not duplicate the, the one that exists already in Lawrence Heights. So we're going for the very new uh, ideas and very new spaces that are missing so far. And so we're trying to envision it as a part of the second phase of organization. Before we proceed, Elena, let's backtrack to the, the yeah, thank you so much. Uh, who are you, Elena? I know we're all friends, but I know who you are. Um, all yeah, I, wanted to make, I wanted to make this uh, seamless uh, information part. Uh, so my name is Elena and I'm uh, director of the Lawrence Heights Arts Center. It's a grassroots organization led and uh, facilitated by the residents. And uh, uh, we came up with this idea of this youth program that we started last year with Joy and we continue this year. Yeah, sorry. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elena. And this project, the project they're working on is basically creating a pavilion uh, with residents uh, and it's for uh, the Lawrence Heights community. So we're going to start first with our first presentation um, uh, from the New Heights Creative Arts Center. What's going to happen is they're going to present for the first 15 minutes or so. And then if there's any questions or comments or feedback or any kind of conversation afterwards, uh, we'll have that for the next 15 minutes. And then we're going to go into the second presentation. So you can begin when you're ready. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our design. So the, des uh, the name of our design is the New Heights Creative Arts Center, and it was developed by the youth architects, Talia, Diana, myself, Apavan, Shobiga, Natasha, and Jacob, and with the help of our client residence council, Simon, Salman, Denise, and Natasha, we were able to come up with this design. So why did we choose this site? It is, uh, it is a center and focal point of our community, a visually appealing addition to our proposed green space, and out of the chosen location has a lot of potential. Potential out of three proposed sites, the chosen location boasts the most potential. Boasts the most potential due to ample open space in comparison to north and west locations. It is a Um, next slide. So this uh, diagram shows the current versus future on the map and the yellow is the selected site for the new pavilion. So what the gaps, what do we have? A few disconnected green spaces. Design constraints include of three rooms, 100 square meters and 15 high 15 feet high each floor. Rooms need to have a clear purpose. One room can be shared by two councils. Two sets of washrooms must be gender neutral slash accessible. Fires and includes a fire escape. Should not duplicate another space that already exists in the Lawrence Heights area. What is missing? An anchor space. It is not suitable for every type of activity. What were the client requirements? The clients expressed that they needed a space for artistic expression, a space for programs that need computers, versatile for meeting use and other purposes, gardening amenity, all spaces available year round. Conceptualizations of dreams for space. The concept of the pavilion was based on the residents we had so that it accommodates their needs as well as the communities and the benefits the space would provide. So as Atavan was saying, how do we patch these gaps? So we decided to answer this question and the situation based on the three questions to show on the slide. How does the design concept meet the needs? We want to define spaces for councils and needs, versatile so that it can accommodate meetings and larger groups for a variety of programs and group councils. Who are the users of the pavilion? 
community members, professional workers, council members, and government officials, as well as program facilitators, program participants, gardeners, students, and much more. And what does the pavilion offer? Access to safe materials and tools for creativity, a computer lab space, a meeting space, which is derived from the computer lab, a garden kitchen space, as well as a green space, such as for gardening. And so the development of the idea emerged from the youth architects component, the clients component, collaborative dynamics, as well as the final design. We had a few inspirations from other architectural designs, and one that really stood out was the Search Center that is a part of the OCAD University, designed by Will Alsop. Furthermore, Will Alsop is an acclaimed architect behind the award-winning OCAD University building, who inspires young architecture students to dig deep and create a design that is extraordinary and out of the box. Later on in this presentation, you will see some similarities between this building and ours. As you can see, we have gone through multiple phases and ideas shown by the full plan. Youth architects work with the systems to create plans and drawings using various mediums, such as JSPaint.app, Tinkercad, as well as pen and paper. So after the initial design process and brainstorming, the design team and residence council met together on Zoom, discussed needs and desires. This allowed for community needs to be heard and met substantially. So some components that we wanted to add were indoor and outdoor space for meetings and community gatherings, signage, garden space for indoor use all year round, allowing gardening opportunities in the cold winter months, and safety concerns. So as you will see in later slides, safety was incorporated via give and take. Both the design team and the residence council agree that safety is of course a first priority. During one of our Zoom sessions, one community member suggested removing the south wall of the room in order, in, sorry, of the computer room in order to increase usage of space. Due to fire safety protocols, it is important to be able to contain fires in case of emergency. So council and design team agreed on installing a large sliding door that can open to increase space and close securely in case of emergency. We had an extreme importance of a strong relationship between the design team and the residence council. So what collaboration means for us during this process is that the community members or the residence council essentially became co-designers. The design team coached and taught participating community members about the process of design and architecture. And both teams explained the importance of adhering to measurement, measure, sorry, measurement guidelines and safety protocols. So i.e. installing emergency exits and staircases in the happenstance that elevators cannot be used. There was a focus on accessibility and we needed a visually appealing space for community members to gather and use. The Residence Council brings functionality and community needs to the design team. And the design team was focused on technicalities and logistics at first, but the Residence Council bridged purposefulness with the design team's specifications of what it takes to create a safe and functional building structure. There is an equal give and take during the process between the clients and the student architect. On the left, you will see that we have client needs and desires. And on the right, you will see the design team's response and solution. The client expressed a desire for a bigger space for community meetings. And the design team suggested sliding doors to open up space in the computer room. The client also expressed interest in large windows. And the design team incorporated ceiling to floor windows in the final design version two, which you will see in later slides. The client also stressed that multiple accessible washrooms are very necessary. And of course, the design team included washrooms on all levels of the pavilion. Okay, so this leads us into the design process with the first iteration. The first iteration has very humble beginnings. Um, in Tinkercad, which is a basic 3D modeling program, we use simple shapes and features to help communi communicate to clients where their needs would be met, and how these spaces would be defined. So in these, so the three basic spaces were created, um, a cafeteria and meeting space, a computer lab and an art studio. This, their collective information was then, this design was presented to them, and their feedback was then used in the next iteration. 
the site, and this is the second iteration. Um, this was uh, presented internally to our design team, which concluded that um, it's rather chunky and not, not exactly what we're looking for, um, but it also answers some of the community's concerns with the first iteration, such as there was an outdoor space, which the residents uh, suggested in closing due to we live in Canada and cold weather conditions. So that space was only usable for a couple months of the year. So with their recommendation, we enclosed the space and created a prominent roof feature, which is supported by three pillars. Before this was presented back to the clients, because that's kind of how our system works, um, two iterations were created for the third design. So we're going to go through both versions. Both versions were presented to our clients and then chosen. And I'm just going to kind of prompt and ask if anyone in the chat or watching this presentation can spot the difference between the two variations. And then if you want to speak about it, um, just feel free to talk or message. So this is the first variation. And then this is the second variation. So if anyone has any comments, sees any difference, So I don't, I don't really see anyone typing, so I'm just going to go ahead. So in the first variation, there's a big brown there. Yeah. That's, that's kind of correct. Yeah, so in the first variation, we met with our a late member to our team, Raza, University of Toronto professor. He suggested us moving away from the very narrow and to the more broad and using the roof feature kind of to define the building and have it fully supported. Um, so that was the first, first version. So moving to second version, um, since our residents still wanted in kind of indoor outdoor space that could be used maybe for garden programming, um, we enclosed that space, we brought glass up to the roof feature to fully enclose it. Also, as you see in the bottom image here, bottom right image, um, it was proposed to have, to use that, that space, which is now two levels, as kind of like a meeting or movie space with a, you'd be able to kind of drop a screen over that south facing window wall with the pillars there and be able to project on it and kind of imagine the space being used organically with different types of seating or running kind of, I don't know, a program or meetings from that. So that would be a very interesting space. So these two designs were presented to um, our clients, which resulted in them, cho them choosing the second variation. So. Yeah, so here you can see it, um, some very notable, so then we went, moved away from Tinkercad and into SketchUp, which is a more, allows a higher resolution, better visualization. So a couple of fe key features from this slide is the inclusion of, on, you can see on the left floor plan of the first floor, there's a computer lab with a dashed line Speaking to our residents, we wanted to create this space that was dynamic. It was be able to be used multiple features. So this dash line represents a retractable walls. So it would allow the space to be completely opened up, but then also enclosed into uh, smaller designated meeting spaces, which was also um, something that was lacking in the community. There, another notable feature is the inclusion of these big storage closets slash cubbies and they would allow for let's say this computer room lab space was completely collapsed all of that equipment could then be stored in the storage units and be locked safely and let's say then you have a public event such as i don't know an art show you wouldn't have to worry about that um, another big concern was the use of bathrooms as the space is a community space and it wanted to be 
it'd be used for running kind of children programs, youth programs with a lot of students. So in one of our meetings, it was 20 to 30 uh, students was suggested. So with that many people, bathrooms are essential. And then, yeah, so here you can just see more of the outside SketchUp design, uh, final design. This is what we ended up on. Um, from feedback from previous session, windows were expanded all the way down to allow a lot of natural light into the space. It's mostly open, kind of blurs between inside outside with just how many how much window and is here. Also, another interesting feature is in the inclusion of stained glass, different types of glass, which would play very interesting in the light in and around the space. So at different times, different periods of the day, the shadows and light penetrating the building would change how it looks. So that another very interesting feature also around the pillars would kind of give this shadow effect. Yeah, so here are some renderings. You can kind of imagine what the space may look like in our location, which would be kind of a green park space. So this is a ground view, and then here's another one. So you can kind of imagine what it might look like if it was implemented. So from the designs and models, Jacob was talking about the three pillars and the representation behind the three pillars are the past, present, and future. And the past represents the plans for the revitalization, the need for a new infrastructure. The present symbolizes ideas, bringing, bringing the community together to pitch ideas, needs, concerns, and conceptualize the future of Lawrence Heights. And the future is what we envision our community to be, our dreams and passions, local artists and students, and participants from the art program in the pavilion will paint murals on the pillars representing these terms. And we really wanted the pillars to symbolize and show how in order to prosper in the community, to perform stability, growth, and possibilities, it's important to coalesce all three forms of the past, present, and future. And that was the whole point of building this pavilion, to revitalize the community, embark a new stepping stone, and make an indelible change that benefits a whole community. And I also want to offer if anyone wants to um, just unmute themselves and ask a question or have a comment or whatever it might be, uh, you can as well. I have a question. Sure, go ahead, Vesta. Yeah, I'm wondering your name and your pronouns. We know that we can say the right things. So uh, I'm, I'm Vesta. Um, yeah, uh, she, I guess. <laughs> um, Thank you. I, I was wondering, have you considered uh, the orientation of the building, of the pavilion? Uh, because you have such big windows, would it be like a, like a passive solar pavilion uh, to keep it warm in the winter and maybe have some trees uh, in the summer to keep it cooler? In terms of the climate inside the pavilion? I guess I'll answer. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Have one of the one of the faces that is completely glass have su southern exposure, right? So then that would pass and make kind of a greenhouse effect and warm in the winter. So de that's definitely that's a good idea. Oh, I have another question. <laughs> So did you, uh, do you guys have, uh, what kind of a foundation uh, are you planning on? Is it, is there a basement or is it like a concrete slab? Or have you thought about the pros and cons of the different types of foundations? I think from our design, we just kind of imagine a concrete slab, kind of a, a platform. Cool. And uh, 
I have a question. Did you consider the parking or any areas for uh, visitors outside of, of uh, Lawrence Heights? Parking? I guess not. <laughs> but having a parking lot nearby to allow um, visitors to come? And the, what about outdoor space? Uh, have you thought of uh, some uh, sculptures or public art included in the surrounding of the pavilion? Or um, maybe some landscaping? Yeah, I consider doing um, different types of landscaping around the building to kind of guide, funnel people into the entrance. Um, maybe the inclusion of benches and like basic sitting areas. You can kind of see that in the, um, what is it called? The images. Yeah, your last images are showing the sitting area that was uh, included in the park uh, settings. If anyone else wants to add on from the, from our group, our team. Um, so we did actually discuss maybe painting the um, three pillars murals. So any um, artistic community members want to come in and paint the actual pillars, then that could be done as well. Yeah, that would be nice. So any more questions? Or maybe comments, maybe uh, additional comments from the group members. Um, if you have any additional ideas, if anything uh, sparked during the presentation, it would be great to include. And we would like to hear from our guests as well, what, are, what the impression and what the uh, ideas uh, be inspired for you as well. It would be great to know. Hi, it's Sarah here from Sustainable. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I really loved, I think my favorite part of the presentation was seeing the evolution. Like we start with the, with the Tinkercad models and the basic ideas of, of space organization and then seeing the evolution through to the SketchUp model was really cool. Um, and I think helps helps us think about how how tools and the tools we're using also play into the design of of spaces um and i was just wondering if um there was if anyone could speak more about whether there's any shading strategy there's a lot of glass going on which is great for indoor outdoor spaces as sometimes the sun can really like bake a space that's filled with a lot of glass um, was there any uh, thought about maybe some blinds or perhaps some, um, what's it called? Some decals on the glass or something for, for helping um, stop some of the direct sunlight coming in? Yeah, there's, there's an idea to have you could definitely do like a kind of blind situation and then have be able to fully close or partially close um, those windows to the sun. Also, yeah, with the landscaping around the building, as previously mentioned, you could add, you could have trees and kind of green to also block um, direct sun. I also want to mention that Amy uh, typed in the chat, I think, for the question around, uh, oh, she, she's still typing. Uh, so maybe just incorporate that into the questions and the answers, answers as well. 
So along with parking ideas, maybe a safe bike, bicycle parking as well. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, 100%, that could definitely be included um, in that space surrounding, surrounding what that, um, where, where the building would be placed in relation to the plan and that park space. And yeah, with solar panels, 100%, yeah, just cover the roof completely. I guess in the winter, it would, could be an issue with snow cover. They would get covered in snow, but it definitely a workaround. I don't know if anyone else has a comment about that. Uh, I have also a question. If you consider uh, the uh, existing context of the uh, well, existing, it will be changed obviously uh, further. But um, have you thought about the surrounding buildings and uh, situation to be included in your perspective of your uh, building as well? In the rendering. Well, have you, have you considered this connection ever uh, to your design process? Sound is going in and out, Lena, just letting you know. Yeah. Uh, it's cutting in and out, it's hard to hear. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was wondering if, if this question even uh, appeared during your discussion uh, about the uh, uh, context that you will be placing the building. Yeah, 100%. So in, in some of our community sessions, um, we pose the question, what should the space be? Should the space be, um, should it be pronounced? Should it be, no, it was constrained by size, but should it be tall? It's bright. It's got these bright columns. It, it doesn't I think it would go well with the images that I've seen of the, the planned kind of development, it would match in certain characteristics, but then it would also be different. So it would be able to stand out and kind of be a centerpiece for at least, hopefully the whole community, but even just that park, that park space that's proposed. That's so great. You, yeah, so going through that community to go, whoa, what's this? It would, it would stand out as something different, not just residential or commercial. And I think it's also important since you uh, created this storyline uh, about the past, present and future, it would be great if these connections with past, uh, present and the future kind of envisioning uh, would be also very uh, boldly pronounced in your, um, in your design as well, right? Hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Joy here from Northwood Community House. She and her. Uh, my question is, it's kind of convoluted, but I'll figure it out. <laughs> I want to hear from probably the students because um, I haven't heard from like you know the students uh, to see you know the highlights of this co-design process because you're working with clients throughout the past two to three weeks. I want to know what worked well. Uh, what Thing that was very challenging about you know collaborating and how you overcame it so any of the students if you want to take that on i want to hear from you as your perspective of uh how was this co-design process for you um i think it was a collaborative process and it was nice to hear what the residents uh wanted to like see from us and it was just really cool to see how like the whole thing just came together in the end because we had a lot of different like uh, phases especially from like just putting it on from like like sketching it out in person to like actually having it on computer I think it was just cool to see how everything just came like from scratch thank you and I wanted to ask uh, Natasha if she can comment on, on this because she's also uh, made interesting uh, transition from the residence consult uh, consultant uh, position and role uh, towards the designer role assist uh, assistantship. So Natasha, can you uh, tell us 
pathologist? Yes, of course. Um, so as a resident a co-facilitator, um, it was very um, important for me to make sure that I was expressing community needs um, because this is a community building. So we want to make sure that the community members will feel comfortable and safe in the pavilion. Um, and it was very nice to see the design team act so vigorously on the comments and the concerns that I had. Um, for example, in the slideshow, I mentioned briefly um, how one of the residents had suggested um, maybe opening up the space so that we can accommodate larger and smaller groups when we need to. And the design team really took that into consideration and came up with the concept of actually completely um, just having uh, doors that can just slide away and sort of like invisible doors. So, you know, we can use this space if it needs to be more intimate so we can close the walls, um, but also if we need to open up the space and have a larger group or a gallery or something like that, then we can do that as well. And I really loved to see um, how dedicated the design team was to adhering to all the concerns of the community. Um, it was very important for them to hear what the community needed and they responded, um, they responded well every time. Like for example, wanting a lot of natural light and just feeling like we were in an open safe space. The design team, again, accommodated very large um, ceiling to floor windows, which is very cool. So for me to be there as a resident co-facilitator and sort of see the whole thing come together was really great. Um, and then I joined the team as a team assistant and I was able to actually take my experience as a resident and um, as part of the team and bridge that together. And it was very cool for me to be a part of that as well. So I just love the, the process that we went through um, as a team as a whole. Thank you. Any other comments from um, our, our guests and folks that are here uh, for team one? It doesn't have to be a question. It could be anything really uh, that you want to share about your experience of witnessing the presentation. Yeah. And uh, there are a few people joined with the Funken. Uh, maybe they would like to ask. Well, it's hard for them to imagine if they didn't see the images. Um, maybe they can introduce themselves and say briefly what they think about the story that they heard. Sure, yes. So we do have two folks that have called. We don't know who you are at this moment. Uh, uh, we have a number ending in 6-5. Uh, so if that's you, and if you can unmute yourself and let us know who you are, where you're calling in from, and any kind of comments you may have about what you heard from the presentation. or three six, the number ending in three six. I'm so sorry for calling you a number. I don't know your names, unfortunately. Um, so if you want to unmute yourself, uh, let us know who you are, where you're calling from. Yeah. Yes, uh, hi, this is Josh Laddie from City Council Mike Cole's office. Oh, hi, welcome. Thank you for coming. Hi, yeah, of course. Thank you uh, for the invite. I'm just here to take notes and uh, relay any pertinent information back to the counselor or concerns that people may have. Great. Uh, don't want to put you too much on the spot, but if any comments or questions about the program, uh, please let us know. Of course. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I wonder if anybody from the second team uh, that will be presenting next, maybe they have some questions? It would be interesting to exchange the students' uh, feedback as well. Mohammed and uh, Mori, maybe you can say something about your 
uh, colleagues? Um, I really liked how the building looked, like it was really colorful and I liked the, um, I liked the way that they didn't make all the windows one color and they were like colorful, so. Nice. Yeah, it was an uh, interesting idea and I, I believe it came up in the, at the very end as well. Yes. Surprising, very surprising piece. I do have a quick question. Um, this is Emma from the Cultural Hotspot. Um, I was just curious um, if the uh, whole building, if it's partially accessible or if the whole building's accessible uh, based on the, the square footage is quite small. Um, so if the washrooms are also like, if that's under consideration as well. Um, yeah, so in our early designs, we had the, like an inclusion of an elevator um, to this, to this other floors, but then on further consideration, um, that was excluded. So full, ac full accessibility would be to the first floor, and that's solely because of the size of the actual pavilion is, is very small. Um, structurally but every everything else all of the other and then i think the bathrooms they would just be gender neutral uh would they be physically accessible like for wheelchair yeah yeah okay cool yeah well, one of our, uh, yeah, I would like to add to that. Um, one of our official councils, residence councils are seniors and we uh, especially work uh, considering their needs uh, as a kind of priority for us. So uh, ramps and the accessibility for uh, those uh, most important facilities were, um, were at the first kind of consideration for us. Um, and then you will uh, also, thinking of possibilities of using the only one floor, let's say, or just two floors and it was very uh, um, kind of long ramp, easily uh, accessible ramp as well. So uh, we didn't want to complicate the project with elevators and everything because we knew that we probably won't uh, be able in reality uh, think this of that scale to have a uh, more complex structure. And so we tried to simplify it as much as possible. And for that reason, we, we didn't, um, uh, we excluded the elevators, like extensive elevators uh, from the building, yeah. But otherwise, yeah, it was the first priority for us to make sure that the, uh, it will be wheelchair accessible, it will be easy to uh, move around and uh, should be like seniors were our first group of uh, consideration. We are going to be moving to the second presentation soon. Uh, Diana, don't forget to save these amazing questions and answers. Uh, thank you so much. And shout out to Diana Lynn, who's been an amazing uh, summer student with, uh, with, with us at Niche in Northwood Community House. Um, she's the one that is typing, so it's not me. Uh, just letting you know and doing all these amazing things behind the scenes. We really appreciate all of her efforts to making this conference very smooth and professional. So thank you so much, Diana, for the arrows, the organization. I couldn't have done it without you. Um, but yeah, final questions or comments in the chat. We are starting the next presentation, I believe at two, correct, Elena? Uh, yep. At two. So the next folks that are presenting, please get yourself uh, prepared and ready. Uh, and we're going to be starting very soon. For folks that are in the in the conference right now, if you need to take a break, grab some water, grab your lunch, your dinner, please do that. Make yourself at home. Um, and that's pretty much it. Also, thank you so much to the first team, design team. You did an amazing job. Um, congratulations on um, making those, like Elena already mentioned it, but I also noticed that there was a lot of changes from the 19th, August 19th to today. I've seen like a ton of changes, like that's dedication. So be proud of yourself. Uh, this has been a, a long ride of us experimenting how to do this program online and everyone has
so successful. So we thank you so much for all your dedication, your hard work, and your creativity. And thank you so much, Natasha, for stepping into two roles, not just one, two. Uh, we really appreciate your passion, your insight, your voice, your presence as a strong leader and resident of Lawrence Heights community. And that's what the whole program is about. It's about us having this strong resident engagement um, component. Um, so I think I can start the introduction for the next team even though we're a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, thank you, Amy, for the comment, wonderful presentation. Um, but yes, we're gonna start segueing into the second team. So please get ready, second team, and just give me a thumbs up if you can in the chat. Um, let me know you're ready to go. If you need time, we still have some time, we have three minutes. Um, but yes, we have a second team. The, the second team is the Crystal, um, <laughs> the Crystal Pavilion. And um, yes, so we have two different, two different perspectives on the same challenge. So we're really excited to see what they've come up with as well. All right. Hello and welcome to the official presentation of Design Team 2, the Crystal Pavilion. We're so glad that you could make it. Before we get down to business, let's meet our team members. We have Havish as our lead designer and our resident co-designer. We have Mohammed as our student designer and also resident co-designer. We have Ace, that's me, and I am the lead researcher. We have Murray as our student researcher. We have Mohammed, number two, as our resident and senior counsel. We have Mariama as our parent counsel, and we have Levan as our youth council. All right, let's get to the presentation's first section, which is going to be consultations, where we give you a debrief of the client's requirement concept, uh, our inspirations, and our research process. We first started the consultations with the residents by identifying what spaces are provided in the community and what's missing. The spaces that we already have within Lawrence Heights are minor community spaces and minor separated green areas, which are also outdoor green areas. And we are missing a safe and enclosed multi-purpose facility for multiple age groups, cultural groups, and religious groups to coexist, engage, and interact with one another in one sustainable enclosure. Based on the acquired data, we formed a concept to remedy these needs, a pavilion designed for residents of all ages and cultures and tourists, which is going to have a multi-faith praying area, a conference room for youths hosting job fairs, youth-oriented speeches and lectures, plus homework help, a children slash parents and sports area, which is going to contain various table sport equipment, such as table tennis and ping pong. And finally, a greenhouse and museum of nature for indoor gardening and environmental education. The pavilion is located on the new map of Florence Heights, uh, exactly where the pink arrow is pointing because this location is accessible, visible, and all in all the center of attention. Well, right now it's time for the fun stuff. We prepared the photo gallery full of cool and unique designs we have referenced and we have gotten inspired by, and I will pass the mic to my friend, Murray, to walk you through them. Okay, so these are the presidents for the window designs. So the Images on the left and right side of the screen is the overall shape we were going for for the pavilion. And then the at the bottom of the screen is what we wanted the top of our meditation tower to look like. Um, so these are some of our sustainability um, elements. We wanted to have like a solar power, we, our, the top of our pavilion wanted to have a solar power pa panel so these are some like um ideas and images we were going for um these are some of the inspirations for the aquarium in our crystal pavilion 
um, we wanted to have it because it was, we wanted to like showcase the sustainability and the wildlife in our pavilion, so. Uh, might I add, it is going to be a floor aquarium, so it is going to be, uh, you know, beneath the floor, as you can see on presidents on the right side. Okay, so this is our research on unusual shaped structure. We wanted to reference it for the overall feel and design of our final pavilion. Um, so this is like more of what we were going for, for a crystal pavilion. So yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Murray. I hope you enjoyed our photo gallery of cool architectural designs. Moving on to section two, here we are going to show you the evolution of our concept via sketches and 3D designs and also talk about a very important aspect of the design process. What part did collaboration and co-design play? Usually with this kind of processes where there are designers and residents, uh, it's often very uh, interview-like where uh, the clients ask something from the designer and the designer will draw it for them or will sketch it for them. We wanted it to be more collaborative. Uh, that's why we walked our uh, we walked our residents through uh, the process of sketching and familiarized them with the 3D design process and the programs that we use. And these sketches that, we are, uh, that you are going to see are developed by the combined efforts of our residents, co resident co-designers and our assistants. Yes, so basically this is our first design that we made in Tinkercad just to get the basic shapes. So at first, our design was specifically for the seniors council. We had one of the clients representing the council and telling us what they wanted to see as a senior. So we have unusually shaped windows because we wanted to have the windows to, um, a, for them to stand out. And then on the inside, we have a space for the seniors to hang out and do whatever, you know, like a chill space. And at the back, you could see, at the back of the building, you could see um, we have a greenhouse for gardening. And that's basically it for the first design. So for our second design, um, once we knew how far we could go, you know, how, or how wide and tall we can make the building, we moved on to SketchUp and we used um, SketchUp to make the buildings more detailed. So you guys can have some kind of knowledge of how it's going to look, um, you know, how the, uh, and how the building itself is going to turn out. And then we had more clients come in. They were representing the parent council. So we wanted to have a second floor specifically for the parents. We added new things and changed the size, the, the size of the greenhouse, um, the scale and the scale of the whole building itself. So now the base of the greenhouse starts at the, um, at the first floor and connects onto the second floor. We also changed up um, the, shape, um, the shape and scale of the skylight having diamond shaped skylight. Um, in the center of the roof, um, we have added up, I mean, uh, on the roof, on um, the side of the second floor, we have added a porch for, um, so that the people in the second floor can um, kind of go out on the porch and have fresh air. Um, we also have a place to sit outside right below the porch, as you can see, it was made specifically for the seniors who are located on the first floor so that they can just go out and hang, um, you know, hang out outside of the porch and get some shade. Also the base of the pillar that supports the porch acts like a plant bed, like a plant bed. Um, so we have plants growing out there too. We have also added a tree shaped solar panel as, as it was mentioned um, in our reference. Um, you know, we got the idea from John Packer. Uh, for our third iteration, uh, we sort of came up with the idea to have three separate rooms and the greenhouse at the back of the building. And we also went with a more circular kind of feel, as you could see by our circular windows references. Uh, 
Uh, room number one is the children and parents room. Room number two is the conference room. And room number three was supposed to be washrooms and amenities. And room number four is the greenhouse space. So before we move on to our final design, just a little heads up. There is not much similarity between the exterior of our previous designs and our final design. However, as you can see, the programs offered and the number of rooms is identical with the third iteration. Uh, we made this sudden change because we wanted the building to stand out and be a relief from all of the boring kind of buildings that already exist in Lawrence Heights. And we wanted it to attract tourism. And with all that expressed, cubes and any variation of cubes was just wasn't the right way to go about it. And now behold the almighty crystal pavilion, which is our final design. So as you can see, uh, the main room is going to be the lobby, sort of this tall building that is lying down on the floor. That is going to be our lobby and the Museum of Nature greenhouse on the second floor and on the uh, base floor, there is going to be the kids room and family and the sports. Uh, the structure on the left side is the conference space and the study area. Uh, the structure on the left is the main entrance and the tower that you can see is the multi-fade tower as we call it. It's the space for uh, multi-fade based worships. Uh, these are basically the more refined sketches of what we envisioned. Here you can clearly see where the greenhouse is going to be located. And also you can see the interior as people go up to our Museum of Nature and Greenhouse, the children playing area and how everything is going to be structured. And above you can see uh, the picture of within the multi-faith prayer tower. Uh, here you can just see the conference room and also this is the main entrance. And you can also see how people are going to move from one structure to the other structure so you can see the doors as well. Now let's get a tad bit philosophical about it and tell you about the true story behind this pavilion. So we said we changed the exterior design to a crystal because it's more attractive and more unusual. But as you witnessed in our uh, photo gallery, there were many options other than a crystal. So why exactly, why a crystal? Negative stigma has plagued our community. It's always been targeted by social media and journalists as gray, crime-ridden, disconnected, and all those bad stuff, which is very heartbreaking. And we want Lawrence Heights to be free. We want our community to shine like the crystal that it truly is. And crystals symbolize rebirth and purity. That's our ultimate goal to achieve via this building. Thank you for listening to our presentation and believe that it can be done. Thank you very much. That's group two signing up. Um, hello, Andrew. Yes, the aquarium is going to be incorporated in the final design. It is going to be on the base of the uh, youth and parents room. So below the greenhouse. So can I follow up on a question about that? Yep, um, sure. How will you access the aquarium to like take care of what's in there? Uh, will it be fish and uh, it's it's not going to be necessarily fish, even if it is there is going to be fish, it is going to be like you know very accessible sort of fish that you can find you know on your local pet store, like goldfish some sort of things. Uh, we thought that because of maintenance costs and because fish are living things and they need, you know, food and oxygen, we thought uh, it could be more of like a plant aquarium. 
So maybe uh, plants that artificial uh, plants. Uh, plants that are uh, aquatic plants, basically. And I guess you would, you would access it from the top, because if it's in the floor, you can't, yeah, I guess I answered my own question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically you just look down and see an aquarium below your feet. That's how it's going to look like. You can basically walk on it. Cool. Yeah. One of our um, designers, Mohammed, mentioned that it could also be artificial plants um, that's in the aquarium floor. I guess the main purpose of it also educational for the uh, residents, kids, as well as uh, we included them as our main users of the pavilion. And it should be very entertaining as well. Yeah. I'm wondering what second the second team uh, think about it, the other team. Yes, uh, it was uh, completely secret for them. They, they seen it for the first time and I'm wondering how they feel, how do they feel? Yeah, it's a very cool design. I'm just wondering what type of material it would be made out of and kind of the space around it, because it's so different. So, uh, uh, it is mostly going to be, well, not mostly, uh, it is going to be covered with glass, especially on top of the greenhouse. Uh, there are going to be solar panels covering the south of the tower for sustainability purposes, so we can provide the building with electricity. And we thought of like using some sort of like a strong material that could withstand the pressure of snow and rain and also withstand the heaviness or the weight of the glass that it's going to support. So not sure exactly what kind of material, I can't name any kind of material for the solid part of the building but something that can withstand weight and withstand snow. So something, you know, something very strong. I wonder uh, if you can uh, describe us a little bit more about the consultations and the, uh, how the residents uh, consultants uh, received and the, uh, um, the, this new, the final design uh, that you came up with, and if there were any challenges uh, uh, working together on that final design. And especially, so, it's very interesting space that called uh, uh, multi-phase uh, tower, which is very unusual as well. I haven't seen any uh, anything like that in the neighborhood yet, and I wonder how did you come up with this idea as well? So basically about how we came up with the crystal design, it was mostly because of the philosophy because it represents rebirth and purity. And there were a lot of drama surrounding this crystal design, especially with the consultations with the residents. Uh, they were not convinced, convinced that it can be done because it's very unusual and it's a very radical decision to go from that box format to a completely new format and something that hasn't been done in Lawrence Heights before. So um, yeah, there was a lot of drama surrounding it and we had to do a completely separate presentation in terms of how it is going to be done engineering principles and why exactly a crystal shape in order to convince our residents and yeah, that's basically it with the crystal. It was a very dramatic era for the group, but we you, worked for it. Can you uh, give us more explanation about the tower itself? Because I know that we had a, a special resident who required specifically this uh, uh, worship place as well. And, uh, 
and how how this conversation was about like did you come up was it easy to envision this place for you guys for, for designers or uh, how did you go about it I'm just interested of evolution of the so the multi faith tower uh, it's a space that doesn't exist in Lawrence Heights definitely there are places for prayers for different religions but not specifically an enclosed area for multi-faith prayers. And uh, firstly, our client asked us to provide them with a room for a specific kind of religion. But since we are designing this uh, pavilion for the community, we came up with this idea of uh, having a multi-faith based tower. It wasn't easy to envision, but we thought of running surveys, running programs, and considering maybe the top three or the top four religions that are practiced within Lawrence Heights area and providing the equipment for the people to be able to practice their religion freely in an enclosed area and in a safe space and actually together. So maybe they could learn about each other's culture through religion and through religious practices. So that's another positive point about it. That's great. All right, so is there any other comments and questions? Yeah, I have a question, kind of similar to the first question I had for the first team, but a bit different. But for Maury and Mohammed, I just want to get a sense of like, what was the highlight for you uh, in this whole process from co-designing to sketching to researching to now the conference? Like, what's the best part of this experience for you? Uh, I guess it was just fun coming up with the design. The design. I really uh, enjoyed it. Thanks, Mohammed. How about you, Maury? Um, I liked getting to know like everyone and like um, researching about buildings and stuff. I'm seeing a question from Joel. Sorry for not answering it sooner. So Joel said, can you tell us more about the greenhouse por portion of the building? How would the greenhouse be accessed? Would it be a community garden or individual plots for community members or families? Uh, I'm glad that you liked this story about the crystal and about the greenhouse portion of the building, about how it can be accessed. Uh, if you remember the main, uh, the main kind of building uh, of the crystal that was kind of laying down on the ground. Uh, that's where the greenhouse is located. It's on the second floor. So when you enter the building, you are going to see a ramp and that's how you're going to access it. Maybe uh, is, could you open the slide that shows exactly what you're talking about? Sure. It's a slide, I guess, if, if you can show uh, it again. Uh, yes, Diana, yes. And this is going to stop your screen sharing for a bit. If that's great. Hello. Hey, Vic. How's it going? Just Hi, Vincent. How are you? I'm just listening to Q&A. I just didn't want to disrupt the flow. It seemed like they were oh. going full tilt. Okay. Oh, and you brought Nini too. Man, you guys come in packs. Hi, Nini. So Ace, if you can go back to the slide, if you can share for a, for a moment and explain where is the ramp, I, where is the access to the greenhouse. I did the mistake of closing down the slide, so it's going to maybe take okay. like two minutes. Right. So go ahead, you guys, if you want to add anything. I think, I think I have your slide open. You want to just like point to Yeah, thanks, Diana. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so do you mean thanks, Diana. So it's here you 11. can see, this is where the greenhouse. Yeah, that's it. Slide yeah. Seven. It's a slide 14. If you can open slide 14, it shows the uh, layout for the 14. No, next one. No, and next one. Uh, go further. Uh, Diana, it's just further? go to slide 20. Diana, it's slide 20. No, the, the plan. Yeah, 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 that's it. That's mm -hmm. it. Uh, yeah, that's it, Elena. So, this is the main building, as you can see, side open. Uh, as you can see, there are two floors. 
the first floor is going to be the children playing area and sports and youth. And you can also see the ramp, which is going to lead you to the second floor, which is going to contain the greenhouse area and the Museum of Nature. I think it was Joel. I hope that answered your question. And I, I would like to invite our new uh, yes, uh, who joined just now. Maybe they have some questions because they've seen this presentation before. We're just wrapping up the second team. Uh, the presentation. Well, I just wanted to say though, um, you know, I, I was looking back at some of my notes in preparing my talk for today. So I thought I'd show you guys. I was inspired because when I was, these are, this is what props do when we're like looking at kids' projects. So this is this, this, like the illustration I had of team one right off the bat. I'm not sure you can make that out. Uh, and I was like, oh, this is going to be so cool. And then team two with the crystal form, I was like, oh man, it's going to look cool too. So it's funny. I, I write all these things with all the notes. And um, I'm, I'm listening and, and seeing some of the comments that have been made by, by some of the community members. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad to see that, uh, you know, what good design is not design that just people go, yeah, meh, right? Good design is when people are in some way, uh, not even just provoked, but I would say inspired, right? So, you know, some buildings in the city, we don't all necessarily like every single building, but you know what, it causes a conversation. People have to know where they came from, where those designs came from, and uh, what was the thought behind it. You know what, with a lot of you, um, again, with the scant questions and answers that I heard earlier, uh, the fact that you guys were able to respond to community groups and um, had really good reasoning for it, um, you know, love it or hate it. You know what, you, you guys are pretty much, you guys are accustomed, like, first off, I still can't get over the fact that you guys are, like, in high school. And second thing, uh, that you guys are pretty mature at explaining things to other people and uh, presenting your ideas, so. Thank you very much, guys. Thank you so much, Alison, for such an uh, important one. Yeah, thanks a lot. So we have, well, we, we don't have any time left for the comments, but we welcome anything uh, you have still in your mind, share with us on uh, chat. Yeah. And we're moving forward in our agenda. For sure. And there is a comment in the chat from Amy. Uh, what a creative eco design. I love the unusual design and risk taking in the structure. As you think outside the typical box design, it, be, it would be for sure a sunny neighborhood attraction. I love the amount of openness. Openness and glass both groups have incorporated. I can see the amount of work and thoughtfulness put into the, the design and presentation. Well done group. So congratulations, both groups. Uh, we are going to move into the next phase. Just want to check in with Vincent and Victor to let you know, to ask if you're ready. I don't want to put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready, but uh, man, I don't know how to follow up the, what you guys present. So I'm I'll, sure throw it's gonna be amazing. Those, I'll throw Victor under the bus on this one. Victor, your name is first alphabetically. Just putting it out there, man. <laughs> Victor and Vincent, remember. <laughs> So we're moving into our presentation from one of our partners, uh, U of T and Ryerson. Uh, we have Nini, Victor, and Vincent here. Um, and just take the floor. We're excited to see what you've come up with. Oh man, don't let him down, Vic. Don't let him down. Just, just give me one moment. <laughs> sure, okay. So we're just gonna take a little moment. Uh, uh, let me see, share screen, but uh, this will stop all the screen sharing. Do you want, yes, but okay. Uh, okay. Can man, you, can there's you... no pressure, eh? Because like the kids <laughs> did a really killer presentation, and then now we got to be like, yeah, and <laughs> and this is what I did. Uh. <laughs> so okay, um, can you all see my screen? Yes, you yeah? okay. can see. Awesome. It. Yes, so, okay. thank you. So you know, once again, I'm, I'm Victor Persamado. I'm an assistant professor for urbanism at Ryerson University School of Urban and Regional Planning. Um, today, what I wanted to share with you is uh, some of my projects that similarly to what you guys have been doing, or like they, you guys saw all your, all your kids, uh, they engage with the city, but uh, at a smaller scale, and they provide art, participatory design, public engagement, placemaking, and most importantly, kind of like what you guys are, what Vincent was just saying, 
is that uh, what I try to do is uh, portray or um, or it's meant to to do storytelling uh, to to people, right? That you can do create you can do whatever you want, but at the end of the day, your project has to to convey a, a story and a provocation or something, or at least a reaction from from people. So in the last two years, I've designed and built uh, with students uh, from UFD, and now now that I'm moving to Ryerson, I hope to do the same. Uh, five interactive public installations across the city, and that's what I'm going to be presenting to all of you. Um, this one, uh, well, one, public space activation allows us to reclaim parts of the city that have been taken over by, by one, utilities and vehicles, and instead it sparks people's curiosities and triggers social interaction. For example, in this project, uh, during the King Street pilots, uh, we installed two parklets, one on the east of uh, King Street and then on the west part of King Street. And over here I have, uh, it's not a project that is just by me, but it's a gigantic group of uh, people that we always collaborate, right? So uh, it was Dina Sarhain and Mani Mani from uh, Make Studio and students from, from UFT and we put all, all this together. Um, and again, it, it was participatory design. So the city was part of the uh, creation of the project. Um, and a description of the project is basically hundreds of, of colorful foam noodles were clustered together to create a cheerful and immersive environment that encouraged play and relaxation in one of our busiest districts in, in, front, in front of Metro Hall, basically. And then I also wanted to share what it's really important and then normally what we don't see, which is the process of design and fabrication. Uh, and it is equally important to conceive an idea for the public realm in collaboration with public entities as it is to understand how, um, how to study and how these ideas come together in, in a reality, right? So in this case, for example, I have students mo doing multiple prototypes, fabricating, uh, putting all these ideas that just look into a rendering and we have to like come up, make them look exactly what, what we were proposing to the city. So we have here, for example, us in with Mani Mani doing the prototypes, then my students and I at school, and then obviously because we can't see it on, on foam noodles, we have to create a way to design them and look like they were bundles of noodles, right? Um, and then the second wall of jungle was across, a street, um, across uh, St. James Cathedral. And this one offer, again, similar like an interactive and foam parklet for children and adults waiting for streetcars. And also <laughs> the dogs seem to enjoy um, our installation. And then uh, light, uh, it's so, and perception of light in design, it's very important when, for example, when you guys are designing something uh, or when uh, an architect designs uh, something for the public realm, it can really transform a place. And in this case, what's what we wanted to achieve in our project for the Ontario Place Light Exhibition, which we had in uh, this past February. And the project was called Lumina. And it was an immersive art installation that uses the medium of arts, lights, and color to create a three-dimensional optical elusive cocoon. And again, based on the concepts of light, art, and light painting, this installation invited the general public to be submerged in a series of never-ending glowing canvases. This case, as you can see, we again we we created like a lot of like little prototype models before you create a big one because otherwise it's too much money to be uh, um, uh, um, doing prototypes that, we, that then you're not gonna use. Then when we found out what we wanted to do based on light, colors, uh, we designed it at school, we uh, CNC milled it, and then we basically started putting it together, and fabricated. And it was a lot of work because we had to find uh, glowing in the dark with black light uh, painting that were that are used for special effects. So it was very a very interesting process of uh, learning process. And this is what it looks like um, from the twenty. Uh, we use again LED UV black lights to highlight the helipsoid uh, shape geometries. And you can take pictures inside, or basically spectators can walk around these objects and. Uh, and it looks different every time that you walk. But if you're inside this, uh, this object, the last piece of the camera, like highlights, or basically you can see it, you can see Ontario Place at the end of it. Similar like if you are in a camera. And then 
I also wanted to present this project, which uh, which we just uh, finished in the. It was a design at the beginning with sidewalk for sidewalk labs, on um, Queens Key, um, and then again it was designed with students uh, from uh, UFT and now students from Ryerson, and it's a it's an immersive educational pop up park for the public, which is now being currently exhibited at the base of the CN Tower, and. It, the project is called Peps and Hex. An installation includes timber pebbles with solar power kinetic lighting and hexagonal planters. And these are meant to invite the general public to activate the grounds surrounding the building. Now basically the, um, the, um, the CN Tower. So in this case, for example, the Peps and Hex was an opportunity to explore innovative design strategies that, that embrace, embrace one participatory design. And as you can see here, my students were playing around with how to use these pebbles, a seating uh, or place making. They used it even to put bean bags and sit around and create a, an interesting um, atmosphere. Or three material prototyping where we designed these kinetic lights and we built and the students built them at school um, basically and they work with the wind and they're solar powered. And the last part is also a native plants uh, mini forest, uh, educational mini forest, where people are going to go and see what are the native, native plant species from Toronto and why are they important to our, ecology, to our ecology in Toronto, as well as wildflowers and other um, herbaceous plants. Um, and here, for example, that's my students and I last summer doing again more prototypes building the planters with CNC machines. My students were in the, in the fabrication lab building all these objects. And then we were trying to put them together to see what the place would look like. And again, uh, we had like here different photos of how the pebbles we rearrange and put together. And again, more of them. And then here, I like again to put more, um, more process of how the CNC, what I'm talking about, it looks like this gigantic drill that drills step by step and then you put them together and you build them like a little sandwich and then you glue them and then you start creating these pebbles. And then here we have the lamps and the lamps, as I said, they are kinetic. So let me see if I, if it is, if actually it's going to work my video this time or might not. Oh no. No, I don't think the video wants to work now. But basically these lamps move with the wind. Why is it not working? Anyways. So these are the lamps and they have these fins because they move, the wind moves them around and they, and they're the solar powered again. And this is what the, what the park, parklet looks like right now at the CN Tower. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, it holds a native tree gallery. These are the, all the trees. It goes from poplars, from um, uh, maple trees from, uh, from um, uh, 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 burk oaks. For, uh, so basically they're all native species from Toronto that are very important to, to our ecology. And then the pebbles, which are these ones, they hold different types of herbaceous plants, such as uh, com uh, common milkweed for monarch butterflies or black eyed Susans, et cetera. So it's kind of like a, it's a to, 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 to tell people how important all these plants are, which might not be the most gracefully beautiful uh, flowers, but they are really important for our city. And they're basically right now, the, the pop-up park is in between uh, um, the Aquarium of Toronto and the CN Tower. And it is meant again, as I said, to be an open gallery for the public. And again, these are like more of the pebbles and we had all these lamps that are kind of like bullies. So if you push them, they kind of go back and forth. And then lastly, uh, I want to finish with our 2019 winter uh, station installation of Toronto beaches. And in response to their theme of migration, the project was based on the collective spirit of human movement. Um, and the project was called Cavalcade and it depicts people migrating towards something better. And the spectators are placed in the midst of this kind of like migratory movement. And in the middle uh, of a, a reflection at the center of the installation, which reaffirms that collective movement. So basically you walk on the, all, around all this uh, swirly hurricane of people 
They're all the same type, different colors, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter where you come from, who you are, but we're all in this kind of like migratory um, uh, um, event. And then when you get to the center, you're like, oh my God, that's me. I'm part of this movement, right? So the sea, and also the silhouettes for us were designed to be a contrast again, the subtle white and gray colors of the snowy backgrounds of, of basically beaches during the winter. And again, what, what was really important for us was that as part of the meaning of this installation was that on March 6th of 2019, East End Arts, in collaboration with immigra Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship of Canada and Winter Stations presented a unique Canadian citizenship, citizenship ceremony. And 27 new Canadians were sworn in uh, from over 14 different countries. And the ceremony was presided over by Justice Hardish Dawiwal, and who closed the ceremony by encouraging these new Canadians to be creative, nourish their uh, imaginations and take part part in the arts. And that's why I'm, I'm showing this because um, all of us should be part of kind of like these stories, like trying to, to bring more stories to the city, inspire, or, uh, or, um, or at least as Vincent said, to create a provocation in the city. So uh, with that, I really hope that through our work and the work that you are doing and you might do in your future, together we can plan, design and build cities that nourish the collective imagination, cities that are beautiful, equitable and just. Thank you. So now it's my turn then? <laughs> yes. Right, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I didn't want to like go over time because I know that we only have like 15 minutes. I know, I know, Vic, Vic, but don't worry, man. You know how fast I can talk. Um, so <laughs> kids, brace yourselves. Uh, Uncle Vince is going to talk and it might go fast. <laughs> okay. All right. um, so me... is it okay if I screen share? Or, uh, um, yes, let me just stop my screen. I, am I, oh, yeah. All right. All right. Awesome. And Vince's turn. All right. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, I took a little bit of a uh, skew on this because I am going to definitely show you some work that we've done um, at Ryerson Architectural Science, um, but I wanted to just uh, have a little bit more of an affirmation on some of the content that you've done already. So, after having seen your presentations and seeing just the level of production, as I said, like, uh, you know, back in the last, earlier presentation, I was so amazed at what you guys did. I have to make mention of a couple of things that really have to happen. So in architectural science, uh, teacher Ryerson, we do the typical stuff. We make 3D models. We make really cool concepts. We even do renderings, just like what you guys did. I mean, I, in your case, I know that you guys probably didn't have access to like a laser cutter or 3D printer, but you know what? Um, this is the same kind of stuff that, again, students in university do. They do it by hand, as you can see in the bottom corner. They do it by computers, just like you guys did. And of course, they make physical models. And, you know, they do varying levels of realism, right? Remember, um, I, I remember seeing some of the works and how you guys Photoshop them um, in, into, into place. Uh, They're fairly good. Um, and like, this is, again, just one step in, in, in university uh, removed from what you guys do. And of course they have to know um, not only how to make really good, interesting, provocative designs, but also how to make those designs quasi real. Now, of course, this is a kid that just is like all of 18 years old, probably doesn't, hasn't lifted a hammer in his life, but he knows at least th that buildings have to have walls, floors, structure, right? Maybe they're made out of wood instead of imaginary like plastic, right? So you see that stuff coming into play in a typical student. And this is, again, very much like what I was seeing earlier. And even in today's presentations, just a little glimpse of that, um, like the floor plans, all that stuff is what you guys have been doing. But I want to also make sure that you guys don't forget that when you guys are making buildings, right, you guys are designing some really interesting spaces. Don't forget about the people. And I'm really glad that you guys were taking in the feedback, not only about the most recent comments about the religious overtones, but also just the general community. Um, listen, I thought it was really enlightening hearing what your comments were and, and uh, from the last presentation where, you know, we were talking about things like, oh, it's going to be glass. And then we walking on glass. And then the discussion was, well, you got to make sure that not only can people walk on that glass aquarium, but then remember, Vic, the comments um, and also make sure that it's bulletproof. Uh, so it's interesting things that we don't necessarily know about. And then, you know, if you start thinking about people interacting with things, that's how you emerge and that's how you start thinking about how designs work. So again, I just want to start that all off with the fact that our students are, are basically, you know, doing the exact same things that you guys are doing right now, except with a little bit more tech. And at least within my program, we do a little bit more VR. And I know some of you guys like video games and stuff. So I thought it'd be a really good chime in to show you some of the tech that you guys have been playing with right now 
Um, you guys were talking about making 3D models in SketchUp or in Tinkercad or what have you, and then rendering it out. Well, guess what? You can do the exact same thing now. I, just, I want to bring your attention. This is, again, first year students. And this is some of the stuff that we do in second year. And you can see, some of you guys have really provocative designs. So in this case, you know, remember that uh, team two, you guys had that crystal? Well, I thought I was looking through my, you know, project catalog of stuff that my students have worked on. And this isn't quite a, a you know, a prism or a crystal, but this, look at this weird looking lobby building, right? And again, it's provocative, but at the same time, you can see on the inside, it still operates as a bit of an art museum, right? So the thing I want to show you about this is that it's not just simply 3D printing something and also getting the pretty pictures, but it's also knowing how this building comes together. And you know what? This is again done by second year, but the best way to know how things work is to basically, let's go inside this. So if you'll indulge me, you guys can still see my screen, correct? My, my web browser over here. So um, I know some of you guys, uh, maybe not so much Fortnite, because I know that's kind of like violence and stuff. But um, as you can see right here, I'm just going through the game, I'm oh, sorry, going through the building. And this is exactly what most uh, of my students have. So that not only can you just walk through, but you can start browsing and looking up and looking down at how the building works, right? Like you can uh, turn to left, turn to right and see how the building operates. So this is the kind of stuff that we've got. And listen guys, you guys, oops, I'll just get back to my presentation. You guys have pretty much the same um, skill set and the same uh, capacities, okay? So let's let me come back to this. So um, I noticed also that when you guys were designing your spaces, sorry, your buildings, you guys designed from the outside in. That's really good, but also keep in mind that a lot of stuff uh, needs to be sorted on the inside out. So some of the spaces, I just wanted to draw your attention that we talked about the opportunities. When Victor and I were co commenting on some of the ways you guys can make your designs better, it was always because we're thinking about how the spaces on the inside worked as well. So once you start getting that knack of not only making the 3D models and you know, imagine what the building looks on the outside, Imagine what it's like on the inside and you'll find that there's amazing opportunity to really make for amazing space. In this case, the students were designing a library, right? And I don't know how, like what gravity pads they have, anti-gravity pads they have in this building, but for some reason, uh, the shelves apparently can get the books on the outside of the uh, atrium, but hey, I'm not gonna comment. Um, so again, we have all these production techniques. And the reason why I'm talking about all these techniques is because this is coming back to some of the stuff that I've done with um, indigenous and archeological um, researchers, because we go beyond simply architecture, right? Like in your case, you guys aren't just simply pretending to be architects. You guys have to work and understand how community groups work, how the government works, how social programs work. And as a result, you have to make sure that when you design, you have to look at various different factors. So in this case, this is just me working with some of my colleagues on some indigenous and archeological evidence and we're using some of our architectural knowledge of 3D modeling and digital design and we actually did our digital reconstruction um, with some video game developers of an indigenous settlement right so you might not necessarily see that it's architecture like the stuff that you guys are doing right now but I wanted to let you guys know that it's always about folding in different dimensions different media and different techniques to make your skill set even better because if I just go beyond that let me just take one little tangent and say that a couple of my uh, students they've also worked on things like this like um, this is some architecture but it's actually architecture that never existed this is architecture from a small little movie you might have heard of it it's called uh, Lord of the Rings um, so some of my students have worked on movies like Lord of the Rings Okay, um, and then one of my students, he actually went out and he actually got to 3D scan um, and I do some work with 3D scanning, he got to do some uh, 3D design work with his computing skills um, and modeling and he actually got to work on some video games. Um, and for my part, I've worked on a couple of video games myself because architects, we actually care about all the structure and all the duct work. But I got asked one, um, one year to help a, a video game company in Canada called Ubisoft. And we worked on a game called um, Splinter Cell where we had to actually take some satellite photos and some historic photos uh, of um, a building, well, the American Embassy in Iran. Um, and we basically recreated some video game uh, levels based on the architecture of that particular building. So again, the stuff that you guys are learning right now isn't just gonna make you guys good architects and community leaders, but also the skills that you guys developed to hopefully open up your eyes to a lot of other careers that you guys might be interested in. Um, and of course, that knowledge base allows students to like make buildings like this. This might look like a cool idea, but the reality is that this is actually real. This is actually a rendering, what you see here, but it looks crazy and wacky, but that is actually the real building. And that's designed by one of my students uh, over the span of their co-op terms, uh, working um, in a notable firm named Partisans in Toronto, right? 
And of course, that's really able to get built up because you get to go on site, you get to see some stuff in the real world, okay? Um, and that's what I think you guys are, are, are already doing, right? Um, though you guys aren't going on construction sites, you guys are already, you know, steeped in the community. So you guys already got some real hands-on expertise on the stuff that, you know, guys like Victor and I, even though we're profs, we might not necessarily know all the little details that are going on in site. And you guys have that knowledge, again, from where you're at. So my students have that ability to take it in, and I told you I'd get you to some of the student work. So, um, for example, one year I um, asked my students to design a pavilion out in a camp for kids with autism. Um, and so uh, we worked in pairs, and I, I said, basically, come up with the best design possible for kids to really experience nature. And so I got these various designs, and the best part is that all of them could have been built just like what you guys did, right? And they did some computer imagery, some drawings and stuff, but guess what? We took it one step further because the designs were so cool that you know it was hard choice, but they actually were able to make them. And you can see there, there's the physical model, there's the digital model on the bottom. We actually made some VR models and you can see some of the kids uh, putting stuff together off the side. But the really crazy thing is that you can imagine the design that you got, look at this, that's the rendering, that's the reality. Like that is a pretty good shot right there where you go from the cell phone and you actually see the reality of what happened, right? And that's the stuff that I think that should inspire you guys, right? Because I think when you guys have presented those really amazing designs, I think that really is inspirational to not only you guys, but also to the community as, at, at, as a larger uh, group, right? So here are some extracurricular works. You know, um, Victor was commenting about the winter stations. I I'll show you winter stations in a bit, but here's another one that um, my kids did. Um, it was a different program, but it was out by the waterfront. And uh, we took advantage of it and built it so that um, it would frame in views of the Sky Dome, of CN Tower. Uh, so basically it had mirrored surfaces so that it was basically all about making like the selfies, right? So these are the kids actually at work in negative 40 degrees Celsius weather um, in front of the Sky Dome and CN Tower, um, just making this building come together. And you can see that that's what it is. It's, it, it was really about a mirrored surface on the underside so you can actually see uh, the other um, parts of Toronto in a different way, right? Um, and the students got a lot of credit, cred making that happen. Um, but then coming back to winter stations, again, some more of these fun civic interventions. You know, Victor already did a good job explaining all of what the program's about, but again, how do you enliven the community? Because it's not just simply making solid buildings, it's also making designer interventions that really inspire the community and get them out there to participate. And better yet, for you guys who are designers, who are thinking about how you can actually design something to make the community better. Look, these are all renderings. These are something like you guys would have done, really cool pictures. And it's kind of creative, kind of quirky, kind of funky, and guess what? they actually make them into reality and that's the stuff that you guys can do and hopefully in this exercise you know you guys have been designing stuff and you know what it's just one more step to just get it made into reality and you can imagine that this is a great thing for the community right um, in this one project on the left flow uh, it was all about uh, engagement so people actually put it together and threw little wooden jacks at it to make it happen right so that's the way community works um, you know I talked about parklets uh, sorry Victor I talked about parklets I won't go too much into the parklet that I got here but we've done several parklets as well um, and uh, one year I had four of them on the fly. Um, so we had everything from making wooden cars to making interactive music, uh, you know, uh, pedestrian areas, right? To basically making a, a human shaped uh, pin cushion essentially, right? So you can actually cause those pins to come in and come out, right? Um, but the reality is that it's not just simply making the technology to design the process. It's also using the technologies as Victor's shown, where he was using CNC specialized robotic technologies to make sure that the uh, pebbles could be made. Similarly, I deal with a lot of other embedded technologies. So here I'm working with St. Mike's Hospital, for example, working on surgical walls. So basically we can use UV lights to sterilize some of the equipment. So I can actually just go, hey, over there, that wall, turn that panel, make sure I wanna get that scalpel, right? Turn on the UV light, it kills all the germs. Okay, now I'm gonna point at the right panel. I want, hey, you, Mr. Scalpel, I want you to flip so that I can get the scalpel out, right? That is what we've been working on with, again, architecture and other disciplines working together. And I wanna close off with this one last one, which is about making a room, but it's not just simply a cool looking room. But, you know, again, Victor and I both, we have this affinity for black lights and, and you know, cool looking lights. Uh, we said, I said in this case, hey, can I make a room that breathes, right? Not only does it look cool, like you see up there in that top corner, but what if I could actually make it so that the room breathes in response to the number of people in the room? So basically I had a room that had a bunch of sensors that detected carbon dioxide. 
And the more people that were in the room, the more carbon dioxide would be in there. And this little ballast over here, it would pulsate with more people, okay? And then also these tubes that you see there, they would actually shoot out oxygenated air into the room. And it made for a really cool design for uh, the annual Nuit Blanche Festival. So the thing that I want to close out with is that I've just run through very quickly. A lot of stuff that you guys are doing is exactly what we're doing right now in the real world out in school too. So again, the stuff that you guys showed, you're making your ideas real, right? And you have the abilities and technology to do that, right? Like my kids that are like all of 18, 19 years old, they're able to do the exact same thing you guys are. They just got more tech, right? You guys have a whole bunch of diversity of careers too. It's not just architecture, not just urban planning, but you guys have the ability now with the skills you guys have started looking at now to go into everything from video game, movie design, you know, heck, set design, right? That's the fun stuff. And the last thing I want to say is, of course, all that cool stuff that I've been able to produce, whether it's the kind of archeology span or the kind of stuff with biology or St. Mike's Hospital, it's only when you collaborate with others that you get really cool things that again, eventually become the careers of the future. And I think I got my time limit down. All right. Drop the mic now. Well, you can go ahead. This, you, you, your talk is so influential and so impressive and so encouraging. So yeah, you can talk more. <laughs> no, 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 no. I speak too fast. Victor is better at doing this than I am. So, um, but uh, yeah, I think, I think again, just looking at all the stuff you guys did, you guys inspired me to actually just come up with a way to present this in a you know, really interesting way. Because I see a lot of potential in what you guys are doing right now. Um, and uh, like I said, on, on that time we met, well, I was like, how are you guys high school kids? This is really cool. And it's like just a couple more steps separated from what my kids are doing in university. So good congratulations on you guys. Yeah, congratulations. Um, um, and I hope that that's, uh, whatever you do now inspires you to continue in your future career or endeavors. And, and any questions, kids? It's okay. <laughs> yeah, well, they just <laughs> putting their minds together. Yeah, it's very impressive. I, I'm sure that it's very uh, important for uh, students to envision their future, as, as you mentioned. It, it goes in such different uh, directions, can go potentially uh, as a film, ga uh, filming, making, gaming, and uh, any type of science uh, affiliations as well with architecture. It's amazing. Thank mm -hmm. you so much. Oh, thank you guys. It's a great opportunity. And you know what, honestly, uh, the way I look at it, I've, I've been teaching for about over 20 years now, university level architecture. And uh, it, it's really rewarding to see the kids that, um, actually Nini would be like, glad to hear that. We, we started some camps way back at Ryerson under her watch. And um, some of the kids that were in the camps way back, uh, Nini, they're in first year. I uh, thought you'd like to know that. Um, in, in architecture studying under me. And it's really weird when they're like, oh, hey, old man. Uh, I was, I was at the little summer camp. Um, but now that I know that I've talked to some of you guys, if you guys do come out to Ryerson, Victor and I will be hanging out there. So uh, I'm not going anywhere. Uh, just do a <laughs> shout out. Let me know that, let me know you're the kid that was from uh, the program, whether it was team one with the kind of cool overhang roof or like team two with the cool crystal. Exactly. So that'd be good to hear. Okay, guys. Sure, thanks. Thanks for the invitation. <laughs> no problem. I'm like even inspired. <laughs> to school now <laughs> so virtually, thank you so virtually. much like it sparked so much like emotion in me i was like in awe the whole time I was, like i'm so over overwhelmed in a positive way with all these cool things you can do with architecture and other disciplines um so yes if any of our students have any questions or comments about ryerson or any guests want to have any questions or concerns please let us know or comments uh please uh unmute yourself or type we want to give some time for those questions for this presentation because it was really, really good. I have a question. Yes. Um, really cool stuff that you showed um, of what everyone's been doing. I was wondering about the, um, the breathing room there that you showed uh, mm -hmm. that kind of inflamed with more people in it. How many people did it take to, to get that effect? In the um, 
it, it would be most noticeable if you had zero people and you said, hurry up, hurry up, get about like a dozen people in. You could see the room would just be like, you know, having like a, an attack. But um, usually people kind of slowly came in and co came out. So the high contrast wasn't really as perceptible. Like people tend not to run into rooms and like, okay, five, four, three, two, one, jump in, right? Um, but basically you could actually get a decent response within, because uh, the room was maybe uh, 200 square feet uh, in area. And um, it basically, once you had five or more people, you could actually see the pulsation frequency change, right? Because it was basically, you know, the carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide detectors that you typically find in home hardware stores for your house, right? Uh, we just broke them and uh, modified them. And uh, I asked one of my biology uh, prof buddies and I said, hey, is this enough to determine people will suffocate? And he said, yep, do it. And uh, we, we basically ran with it. So it was the like the blowing up was due to actual air or was it due to like mechanical programming? Yep. Uh, so we, we programmed it. Yep. We programmed it to connect to an air compressor, right? And the air compressor was programmed to with an Arduino basically to uh, go more frequently depending on the ambient levels of carbon monoxide in the, in the, in the room, right? So the sensors would detect, Hey, it's really getting really stuffy in the room. I'm gonna make sure I inject more air. So the tubes would inject more air and then the frequency of the, that inflation thing, it actually went faster. Hmm. That could be like a useful technology for like, like asthmatics or something for, <laughs> or I don't know, for just like small, small, small like office spaces. Um, I think see, so. see that's, that, that's that cross-disciplinary thinking that we need, man. Hmm. Good on ya. I have a question about. Oh, uh, go. <laughs> uh, Jacob, you want to go first? Okay. I have a question about uh, the University of Ryerson. So let's say an architecture student, I don't know how university works, let's just call it for the culminating activity. Have this like design and vision, where there's like, I don't know, an airplane on top of a building. So does Ryerson uh, let students engage with other people from other majors in order to make this collaborative designs? Uh, Vic, do you want to answer that one or do you want me to take this one? Uh, <clears throat> you can go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, so, so uh, I don't, I, I don't know what the planes I'm building, so that's a little bit touchy. Um, <laughs> um, not but, like uh, an I, actual plane, like a the, sculpture. Some no, sort. no. Um, so, so I think in all universities, not just Ryerson, um, they encourage a lot of cross and multidisciplinary activity. I just think that um, within reason, uh, different faculty members are allowed to kind of collaborate uh, with others to allow for them to create some interesting stuff. The, the problem is that... Maybe it's a good thing because Ryerson's a little bit tighter. I mean, Victor's seen U of T and uh, seen Ryerson, and uh, Ryerson's a little bit more condensed. Uh, we're, we're, we're on a tighter uh, series of blocks, um, and, and that's why like, I bump into all the time other profs. Um, so maybe that's the reason why I have an easier access to them. But uh, yeah, like they, they do encourage us in uh, a lot of the undergraduate fourth year programs. There's a lot of collaborative uh, major research projects or thesis work. So uh, yeah, definitely. It depends on the program you're in, of course, um, but take a look. Um, and, and again, all universities are, are good. It's just a matter of finding what's good for you, okay? Yeah, it, it also all depends on the classes that you take. For example, uh, if, uh, if you take, uh, in, in my case, I'm, I'm gonna talk about my experience. If um, one of, a couple of my studios are collaborations between uh, people from the city of Toronto that are giving feedback to students and the students are working uh, in, in, in according to what they, what they want. Um, and uh, that creates a, that kind of collaboration. Uh, there have been other courses when I was uh, back at UFT, where, for example, the Department of Civil Engineer, we collaborate with, uh, with architecture departments to make, uh, for example, um, uh, some, something more of an installation or structure, right, where where the architects need a little bit more help or, or vice versa with the, with the structural piece of the project. And the same with goes for, I mean, I also, with urban design, you tend to collaborate between different disciplines, for example, landscape architects or, um, or, or planners with architect, architects, because at the end of the day, yeah, it's a, it's a full collaboration. But normally that ha tends to happen a little bit more when the students are more advanced and um, they get, they get the, the, ba the basic skills of um, that they need. 
uh, to accomplish this year. Thank you. I hope you didn't forget the yeah. question. Um, I just had a question about, so you guys did multiple um, displays, not display, in, installations. How long do the installations stay up? Or that just depends on the project. Um, I, I you want me to, to you go, you, you go. You go first, man. You go first. Uh, well, it all depends on the installation. Some of them last a couple of months. Like for example, like for example, the the ones uh, winter stations they last for like four months. Then the the one for the Lumina that uh, that we did for um, for the Ontario place uh, again. Well. It was up at four months, but since COVID happened, we have to extend it for six months because we couldn't go, <laughs> we couldn't get it on on install, right? But it all depends. The one for the pebbles and hexagons that we installed as the CN that um, that is supposed to be there for until next year, uh, where we are gonna be rearranging the, the the structure and then put it back together. So it all depends of the installation, right? And and that also allows you to design it based on how long it needs to be in place. So choose materials that will last longer or choose materials that will last a little bit less, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that I've worked on projects, as you saw with that breathing room, that was only meant for one night, Nuit Blanche, right? Oh, no. Um, which which kind of really hurt, yeah. you know, after you're taking it apart <laughs> and you throw it in the garbage parts of it and you're like, oh, man, that because it took like a few months, took about three months to prepare all the design and fabrication of it, right? Um, uh, but then we've also worked on, as you saw, with the pavilion out in the campsite. Uh, that's there forever, right? And uh, and actually, it, it costs a little bit more, obviously, but uh, it actually went up in from design to the computer renderings all the way to you know us leaving the site with the thing up. That was less than four weeks. Um, so, yeah, we 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 had a lot of labor on that one. But yeah, it, it was it was tough, but the kids found it really really rewarding. Cool. Is there any feedback for this pavilion that you build and is there? Did you uh, reach out the users? Um, yeah, uh, well, for, for the, I can speak for the camp one. Yes, uh, the kids love it, but then we also found that kids love to climb things. Um, mm. And then we also found out that people that are outdoor forestry, for some reason, don't know that you have to make sure that buildings aren't near you when you cut down parts of trees. So uh, over the winter, uh, they had an ice storm. So they decided to, in the spring, cut down parts of branches of some trees, like, you know, five or 10 meters away, not realizing that the, you know, circumference of the tree was about eight meters. Uh, so it, it, we had a branch smack into the thing. It built like a tank, but it can't take, you know, it can beat, it can take off like the, the, the force of nature, but it can't beat out uh, little children and um, people with chainsaws dropping trees on your building. But uh, it was, it, the, we got some feedback. It was pretty good. Uh, the, and Victor can speak maybe more to the winter stations, but in general, the winter stations ones, uh, the media covers it because it's, you know, down by the waterfront, people see it and you get feedback instantaneously. People on social media, they either eviscerate it or they go, man, I love it. And, um, yeah. you know, that, that's good though. Again, good design is provocative. So Shobika has a question in the chat. What inspires you and your students to come up with these unique designs? Ooh, oh. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I'm gonna be honest. Um, <laughs> design is uh, like 5% inspiration and like, uh, like 95% perspiration as, they, as, as cheesy as it sounds. But uh, in our case, um, we, uh, what I liked to do personally is like, sit down with, the, with our, our students and we brainstorm ideas, we sketch, we discuss it, and then we, the next day we come back and we're like, oh, that idea wasn't that great. Can we make it? Can we not, can, I, it sounds beautiful. Can, can we actually build it? Can it happen, right? So it involves a lot of uh, um, um, collaboration and conversations and also, um, I don't know, looking at precedents, looking at different things that have been done and say, oh, this sounds really interesting. And also one thing that I always think about design is that if, if the ideas start getting too complicated or, too, or the concept of your project gets too muddy, then the project won't convey the message that you want. So normally two ideas in the one project 
make them beautiful, make them happen and highlight them the most. And that's when it's going to be most successful about it. Yeah. Yeah, t I would agree 100%. And, and just adding to that, one thing that <clears throat> I, uh, so I remember team one, I believe you guys had the inspiration from Will Alsop's OCAD uh, Sharp Center, correct? I believe. Um, so when, when Will Alsop was alive, he actually uh, did a few years before he died, um, hanging out with me in Toronto, right? And I mentioned that before. And <clears throat> one thing that Will Alsop said to me when, you know, is you know, going up for grown up beverages um, was he said, architecture is one of the few professions where people actually go to you to be happy, right? Yeah. If you are going to a doctor, it's because you're hurt. If you're going to a lawyer, it's because someone's suing you. If you're going to an accountant, it's because it's you probably did something bad with your taxes, right? So no one ever goes to those professions with happy things in mind, right? So what inspires me? The fact that people come to me to get something good, right? People don't go to me to go, oh man, I, I need to like make something that's, that's you know, bad or, or like fix something that's bad. It's like, okay, look, I want to make a new home. I want to make uh, a, a church. I want to make a great community center. And I think what we're seeing in what you guys have been doing, um, you guys understand that, right? It, it's, it's not just that you're making a really cool monument that's going to last there beyond your lifetime, right? Obviously, for some people, it's ego and it makes people feel good. But I think deep down inside, good architects, good designers in general in the, in the public realm, they do it because it's actually something that helps the greater community and it actually does something good, right? That's, that's the good part about good design that it's yeah. ins inspires, it comes from an insp inspirational place and it really inspires others. Very well said, Vincent. <laughs> hey, no, yes. Will Alsop did it, not me. <laughs> yeah, that's very true. It, it uh, reminds me of many uh, leading architects uh, saying about architecture is an extremely positive uh, kind of profession that aims to like, not only the architect should be a very positive and very kind of uh, happy guy himself, but he also, yeah, support this and he, uh, what do you call, spread this happiness around him with, with his artwork. Um, I wonder if your uh, programs and uh, projects have any connection with leading architects. Uh, and if, it's interesting if you also encompass, uh, encompass the uh, international architects in your radar. Somehow, uh, Vic, you want <clears throat> you want to start this one off, or say that again? Like, if I if our program it's a, it's a encompasses yeah, all the. Yeah, if you have any connection architects. during your projects with the leading architects, uh, like world known architects, and if there are any international architects that uh, also uh, co uh, collaborate with you. Uh, well, I mean, it it depends of uh, again of studios. From my experience, we had professors that are invited professors or architects for, or urban planners, urban designers from other countries or even from our own country here in Canada that are uh, really accredited and very important. And we bring them as guests, uh, as guest professors and they collaborate with, uh, with our students, right? Um, I'm not sure yet about uh, international uh, programs where, where, where we take students somewhere else but we definitely uh, bring guest speakers or guest professors uh, to, to our department. Or sometimes, again, just guest speakers where they give lectures to, to students. Yeah, yeah I, I think that there's a couple of layers on this one. Um, a, I think that all of my colleagues I teach, I mean, Victor especially, he, he's, he was at U of T and there are a lot of big name guys there. And, uh, yeah. you know, when you can say just down, like, for example, I, I'm in Ryerson and two doors down from me, uh, I, I know it sounds terrible. The guy's name is Marco Polo, but he was the editor of Canadian Architect Magazine. Um, yeah, he's very, and, yes, yes. and he's he's very well known, right? And he actually represented Canada at the uh, pre to, uh, sorry, at the uh, Venice Biennale, which is it's kind of like the every two years they have like this architecture expo or architecture Olympics, right? He basically was repping Canada there. Um, so so just coming back to it, also you saw Elena the the projects like uh, the restaurant that was done by uh, my students working at Partisans. Uh, Partisans just this past year uh, won the top firm in Canada, the top architecture firm in Canada. So um, that that's a good sign. And then obviously, as Victor said, the world's getting smaller with the pandemic, right. despite what you might think. Um, and uh, we're pulling in reviewers, not only from the big names within the, the Canadian climate, uh, condition, but we're also getting people from France, from Japan. Like uh, I just right. actually got the director of Shigeru Ban, uh, big name architect out in Japan. Uh, he's going to be doing reviews with me this uh, fall 
And that's crazy because that's like 12, 13 hours offset and he's still going to be coming in at whatever ungodly hours to review my students at like three in the morning or something. So um, it's a small world and uh, everyone's connected. So yeah, it's, yeah, just reach out and Zoom someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's for sure. Yeah, now it's much easier with COVID. Right. <laughs> Guys, I have a meeting right now. Like I need to head out. But again, thank you for having me. And thank you for showing all these amazing projects. And again, this was really a really inspiring conversation um, that has inspired me to like, like go and like do something like similar to this or collaborate more with you guys because it's, it's really beautiful. Yep. So thank you again. Okay. And I'll see you later, Victor. Yeah. Thank you so much, okay. Victor. Thank you, yeah. Victor. And good job, Bye. Elena and Joy, for putting all this together. Mm -hmm. You should all be right. proud. Thank you so much. Bye, and Take care. Oh, I'll see you, man. <laughs> Take care. All right. So I don't want to belabor it, but you guys, I don't want to, I, I think I'm running over time too for you guys, aren't we? Like, I don't want to stall your- Yeah, we're actually going to, oh, we're going to say, Lena, go ahead. No, I think Vincent wanted to say something. I just oh, want to use the light here. Go As ahead. As usual, Victor says it better than I do, and Victor did a better job. So uh, yeah, you, you, you guys did a really good job. Um, and and I, I don't know, I, I feel like I should be asking you guys for check, check your IDs, but- um, are you, guys in, are you guys already taking an architecture program somewhere else? Um, but yeah, it's, you guys did really good stuff. It's inspirational. And honestly, you guys have started up something that's really good. Um, and listen, kids, even if you guys don't go into architecture or urban design or any of those disciplines, the stuff that you learned, uh, man, it, it opens up a big portfolio of, uh, of career paths for you. So, so don't, don't, if you like something here, it doesn't mean you have to be an architect. If you like 3D modeling, you like going to computer animation, going to video game design, you call it, man. You got that, right? So uh, never look at something as, as just like you got to do one career path, right? There's a lot of careers that don't exist yet, and you guys will be at the forefront of that, okay? Well, great. I think oh, it's, nice. it's, it's a nice transition for our uh, part uh, that we want to honor the students now, right, Joy? For sure. Can I just do one thing before we do that? Mm -hmm. Actually, no, we'll do that. We'll do that first. Sorry. So, so we, we did right now. Yep. So Diana, we're going we're gonna to move on. Uh, so please save that um, document. And yeah, thank you so much, Vincent. We hope no to work with you uh, more closely for our next kind of iteration of this program. Mm -hmm. And thank you for inspiring all of us and uh, coming in and supporting us. We really appreciate it. Yeah. No problem. You guys are doing great and good luck, kids. And if you guys do apply to Ryerson Architecture, I mean, you don't have to, but if you do, uh, look for the spiky haired Chinese guy. All right. Take care, guys. <laughs> okay. okay. Thank you. Yes. So um, I believe it's the next one over. Yes, congratulations. <laughs> we want to con con congratulate all of our youth architects of 2020. Octavia, uh, some of folks are not here, but we still want to honor everyone, whether you came to one session or all the sessions or whatnot. Um, Octavia, Talia, John Mark, Diana, Jacob, Ace, Maury, Mohammed, uh, Javi, Shobiga, Athavan, Diana, Lynn, thank you so much for all your hard work over the past six weeks for putting up with Elena and I <laughs> and for definitely just putting your heart and passion into this work. We, um, we couldn't have done this without you, Elena and I, we couldn't have done this without you. Um, this whole project was, at least online, an experiment for us. And each week we were learning so much as facilitators how to make this program better. And what made this program better was you. So we wanna honor all of you for being a part of this 2020 program, uh, for doing such a great job, for elevating the program. And also I didn't, the name's not here, but Natasha, thank you so much. We are also honoring you for stepping into two roles, not one y'all, two, two roles. Um, and it's so important to have that resident engagement. That's one of our major success for this year is having resident engagement. And I can say Natasha, among with all the other residents we've honored before, has been a beacon of light um, in our program and has definitely made our program a lot better. So thank you so much for stepping into that and, and being an amazing leader in the community. Um, before we go into uh, the end end, I'm gonna drop a, a, a link in the chat um, there's a mentee link and it's basically our version of a evaluation. It's just three words um, of how you feel today of coming to the coming to the conference. Everyone can do it. So that means assistant students, myself, we all can put three words of how we, um, and let me know if the link works. 
in case I put the wrong link? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, <laughs> if it doesn't work, I'll put the right link in the chat um, and I'll share my screen of the results. And Elena, if you have any words, let me know while I get the thing ready. Well, I, I just uh, would like to add to, to Joy's uh, compliments and everything. So I'm very happy and very uh, happy with your work and very glad for all these accomplishments. Everyone uh, um, progressed so visibly and so amazingly. And uh, I uh, hope that you will work further. Uh, so it will be the next project for us, even more ambitious than this one. And uh, yeah, it's an amazing job. And uh, the collaboration is the main part of the whole thing, obviously. I'm very happy that we have very strong team teams and uh, have such, such a such an amazing collaborative work, yeah. Good job. And hopefully, some of you will pursue architecture paths. I hope so. You can influence. Like, I hope that you influenced you in, in some way, so you you can meet Vincent eventually, <laughs> as you as your teacher. Right, and some of the words are coming up right now. Um, beautiful words, uh, informative, or I think organized, creativity. I'm sorry, my, sh my screen is kind of covered up with all this shared screen stuff. So if I'm saying the wrong words, you know why. <laughs> Motivational, fun, inspiring, productive, interesting, uh, proud, creativity. And I think the words are still piling on. We think, oh, oh yeah, there, see, they're just piling on right now. Fun, yep. Yep, so keep on adding your words. I'm gonna add my words. We really thank you uh, for coming into our first day of the conference. And I think we can move to close. What do you think, Elena? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing this, but I will share the results with everyone uh, who's come to the conference, along with the presentations that the youth have done. So I guess we're going into the final slide, Diana. Thank you. And we're gonna have Maury, our amazing student, uh, to close us off for today. Um, hi, so thank you for joining us and I hope you enjoy yourself. Um, my name is Maury and I'm one of the students of the 2020 Youth Architects Program. And I would like to share how this program has impacted me. So the Youth Architects Program has taught me a lot about architecture and how to design. But it has also given me a lot of knowledge and understanding about what people have to do in order to design and create a structure. Um, please join us tomorrow to participate in the Green Change presentation, the Lawrence Heights and Arts Center presentation, and the roundtable di discussion. I have a great day. Thank you, Maury, for that excellent closing. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. We are actually ending early, yay, <laughs> which is a good thing. Um, so yeah, thank you for coming out today. If you have any questions, you can email me or whatever, call me. Um, and we hope to see you tomorrow. So thank you so much, everyone. Congratulations. Applause all around.